Whenever you have a conference in Europe, you, you have, don't have the basic p debate, is science real, right? Because you have that in some other place of the world, right? So-called climate skeptics, some of them funded by fossil fuel industry, do present sometimes a formidable, you know, very unconstructive um, element in a discussion. You do not have that if you go into Europe. People do believe that if science says there's a risk, there is a risk. You know? so, so we can usually start at a very much more advanced stage into the debate. In the United States, it would have been very much dependent on where we would have had the conference. Yeah. You have almost two groups in the United States. You, I mean, in, in, a, in a way, it's a, almost a cultural clash right now. You have the one group, you could kind of say that's kind of European in the sense that they, they, they don't believe that the world has been made by God in a certain way. They, don't, they believe there's evolution, there is a kind of like scientific progress, things like that. And there's another group, um, sometimes kind of uh, associated with the Tea Party, that is kind of saying, look, the world has been made by God in a certain way, and it was made the right way, and nothing can change. You know, anything that challenges that is not acceptable. So they, they have a much more of a cultural debate there. It's a bit like uh, with, the, um, with the smoking industry. I mean, remember when, when smoking was kind of like mainstream, right? And then it became like not so healthy, or it was the awareness of crew that it's not so healthy, there were a lot of interests making a lot of money off the smoking. And so what did they do? The strategy that they used is kind of to create doubt. You know, saying, look, there are studies that say it's not so dangerous and after all. And the same strategy is being used by fossil fuel interests nowadays to um, basically preserve the status quo, the business as usual. Because the risks are huge. I mean, if you think about it, that 40% of the value of the FTSE, I mean, of the London Stock Exchange, essentially, is dependent on business as usual and not taking climate science seriously. Th that means there's a lot of money at stake. You know? um, there are $400 billion per year subsidies into fossil fuels. fuels. You know, that's more than the whole IT industry, you know, the whole market of DLD, if you like, you know, just the subsidies. So um, you can assume people will not give that up that kind of business as usual model without a fight. The reasons for the energy vendor were, if, if, you, might, if you like, uh, cultural. I mean, it, it wasn't a rational choice. It was not driven by climate, you know, to turn off the nukes or anything like that. But in Germany over the last 30, 40 years, as you know, there, there has been um, an emerging green meme, you know, cultural meme, um, that, that covers, you know, anti-militarist elements, ecological elements, uh, climate elements, and that's quite strong, that's mainstream, like, like the Green Party you know, um, being massively in there, and then also the Christian Democrats, the Social Democrats kind of embracing that theme. So you cannot actually win anything in Germany politically against that meme, I mean that cultural meme. When something like Fukushima happens, that tips such a meme into action. You know? I, mean, you, you, I mean, Merkel knew fully well that if she had not reacted, it would have been the end of her chancery, most likely. So she didn't have a choice. But then, because the meme is so strong, it's a consensus across parties. And whenever you have a consensus across parties that is that strong, it's fairly robust. And that means industry now, take Siemens, RWE, they have divested their nuclear competencies. Right? Siemens has shut down its nuclear unit. So has RWE. That means even if they wanted to change it, it would be very hard because the competence is being dismantled as we speak. The way the energy system works, I mean, it's a little bit technical. You, we have a merit order system, right? That means um, there's certain uh, electricity that comes from solar and from wind that is kind of like um, subsidized, privileged, if you like. That comes in first. That's the so-called feed-in tariff. And they have merit order first, first priority. So that, that generates electricity first. That's the base load now. Then the next one is the cheapest, right? And the cheapest right now is coal, actually, you know, because these are old, you know, plants, and the world price of coal is very low because the U.S. is exporting coal because they have got so much gas. And so, from a climate point of view, the better solution would be to create flexibility against um, the renewables or uh, complementary flexibility for the renewable energy sources with gas or with grids. But so right now we are not there yet. So the big question is now how quickly will we find incentives in the market that, that basically make it attractive for people to invest into the flexibility of the energy system. Very technical debate, but very real, because if that's not solved, people will not invest into the infrastructure. Without the investment in the infrastructure, the energy vendor would fail. My organization, the European Climate Foundation, is part of a global network. So there's another foundation like this in China, one in the US, one in South America, one in India. So, so we have actually a fairly dense network. Um, so, uh, and 
the big question is indeed, so, so what will happen in, in China and then technically in India? Because that's where all the growth is, if you look at the plants or coal plants and things like that. Um, the short answer is that if we cannot show an alternative path to a low-carbon economy, what are the Chinese supposed to do? They will copy the old path, you know, high-carbon intensity path. If you multiply that with, you know, a billion people in China and a billion people in, in India, that's, I think, pretty much the end of any reasonable chance to kind of end in a, in a, in a moderate risk zone. Um, however, the Chinese are also very aware that the high carbon path, the high intensity um, uh, economy depending on coal, oil, gas, creates huge health problems. And, and um, it also creates a huge dependency on you know, fluctuating feedstock prices, whereas sunlight is essentially free once you've got the capital stock uh, in, invested into photovoltaics. So the Chinese are trying to balance now their, their very difficult situation that they have now an emerging middle class, um, a health issue, a growth kind of the need you know, um, to kind of stabilize the system in a social way, as the, the social, uh, create social stability, with the need to kind of move to the low carbon economy. And they are very, very keen to understand is a place like Germany as a first mover, a place like Denmark, a place like uh, California for that matter, is the, are they successful? Because if they are not successful, then I mean they will probably kind of in that very dangerous dance, you know, with all these kind of like competing demands go for the, you know, let's follow the old path. So it, the big question is, are we now, coming back to the Europeans, to the United States with California and then these kind of advanced places, are we capable to show it can be done? There are a lot of signs of hope. Um, if you add them all up, it doesn't add up yet to 100% of what you'd need, let's be totally clear. But change doesn't happen in one big thing, you know, in one big step. Change happens usually by building up the confidence step by step. So if there are enough small steps that build up almost like an exponential curve over time, eh? then I would say it can be done. Um, are we seeing the exponential curve yet? Yes, somewhere, I mean, some place. For example, look at the um, cost regression of photovoltaics, right? I mean, the, the way the, the price per watt, you know, of uh, produced by photovoltaics has come down. The price of batteries has come down. The price of, you know, um, uh, other storage technology is coming down, power to gas. There are a lot of kind of like potentials to use um, in that transition from a technical point of view. From an economic point of view, um, we can also see that it's getting more and more into the minds of investors that it's a very high risk to have a 50-year capital um, um, deployment on a coal plant. I mean, it's 50 years where your capital is locked up in a coal plant. I mean, do you really assume that there won't be more extreme weather events, things like that, that will not change the awareness of people? And where we say at some point, well, what is again the root cause of this, you know? And then you come to dirty coal and things like that eventually, right? That's what the science tells us. So in short, I'm by nature an optimist. Um, otherwise, I couldn't do the job. Uh, but I see also um, enough empirical evidence for the small steps there. Um, the biggest gap is that the governance necessary to get this right is not yet in place. The military in total unison across the world says, look, climate change will produce more risks for free trade routes, for mass migrations, for mass poverty, food prices, unrest coming from that, etc., etc. And they, they kind of pinpoint that. So, so the risk is real. Um, and that's also in line with the distribution that the climate scientists tell you. I mean, the, the distributions are moving. You know? Now, the key is, what is a distribution? It doesn't tell you that if you're living on that shore, in that city, it necessarily will hit you. All it says, with a certain probability, it will hit you, right? Um, the, the big challenge is that the human mind is not conditioned to deal with probabilities. You know, it's very hard to deal with probabilities. You always hope against this behavioral issue, um, psychological issue, against all the odds that it will not hit you. Right? So one of the challenges will be um, how do you translate the science, the risk, into something that people will understand.